May, may I ask? No, keep, keep it on your belt. Don't worry. I'm not running away from you. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, very warm welcome back to the tracks. And uh, welcome to the CISO track. Uh, Frank and I, uh, my name is Tobias. We're going to be your host today here at the CISO track. And it's a great pleasure for me to um, introduce you to Jonathan Kren. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, bug bounties. And I think it's quite amazing when I read your uh, abstract. Analyzing 30,000 submissions. I mean, you must have gone crazy. And I was always wondering, like, is there a lot of money in bug bounties? I mean, should I maybe change profession and do that instead? Who knows? Maybe after today we will know more. So without further ado, uh, a very warm welcome to uh, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I forgot. One last thing. Uh, later when you leave the room, if you really love this, give a green card. If you think, well, that was not so great, you can give a red card. Don't do that. And if you are undecided, just walk out of the door and uh, everything's fine. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Can everyone hear me OK? Good? Good in the back of the room? Awesome. Thanks for coming to the talk. Um, I really appreciate everybody. I know we still have people filtering in here, so just find a seat um, and make yourself at home. So what we're going to talk about today, bug bounties. Um, my name is Jonathan Cran. Uh, we have um, you know, some, a, a lot of things to talk about, a lot of data to go through, and some lessons that get distilled out of that. So we'll just jump right into it. Um, this talk actually started at DerbyCon in the USA last year, um, but it's been significantly adjusted since then. Um, and we've been sort of playing with the order of things. And so I'm going to show you some data up front, and then we're going to dive into some of those lessons. And so a quick you know, sort of background on my uh, background. Um, I came out of Iowa State University um, in the States and you know, with a background in system administration, uh, computer science, um, and some software development. Joined Rapid7 as a penetration tester. Um, worked with the Metasploit team for a little while, doing the commercial products and then also working on QA um, for the, the whole of the Metasploit framework. Um, worked with the Pony Express guys for a little while, so I have a pretty strong network background um, in some application as well. And I'm now with Bug Crowd. And what I do at Bug Crowd um, is work with the analyst team, uh, work with customers, work with researchers, and really just get information flowing through the platform and validate submissions, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm actually missing a few logos that have gone missing on here. But has everybody heard of a bug bounty? Is there anybody here that doesn't know what a bug bounty is? No one's going to self-select into that? OK, cool. Um, I'm sure you guys know. Um, they're growing in number and size. Um, the latest example, um, who saw the? United Airlines bug bounty. Yeah. Has anybody tested on the United Airlines bug bounty? Got one in the back. Two? Three? Four weeks. Four weeks? Ouch. Um, OK, cool. But what's good about that is that we're seeing an uptick in other industries. So we're seeing Western Union start a bug bounty in finance, United Airlines in the transportation industry, which is cool. Um, it's good to see this happening outside of like the regular tech. Uh, companies and a lot of tech companies that you see up here, Microsoft, Adobe, um, Yahoo, those sorts of things. Um, so how many researchers do we have in the room? Pretty good group of researchers. How many program owners, which is what we call folks who actually own a program or have started a bug bounty program? So we have a couple people. How many people are interested in starting a bug bounty? Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, so I hope this, you know, we're primarily aiming at folks who have started a bug bounty, um, but I think it'll be entertaining and, and enlightening for both groups. Um, so let's get into it. So across the bug crowd data set, we've looked at 765 high and critical priority submissions over the course of two years. Um, that's out of 30,000 submissions. And so that is, um, you, you know, high and critical are varying and we'll get into like what that means in a little bit but what I wanted to point out here is that there's a lot of good submissions coming through the platform 222 of those are critical issues meaning um, XXE SQL injection um, something where you get RCE basically um, the average payout on a critical bug is around a thousand dollars it's okay um, the highest in our data set is 13,500. That was our highest payment ever. Um, if you break this down by program, 
there's around six, a little over six higher critical severity issues per program. And that's across all programs. And there's 150 different programs. Um, 208, sorry, 2,888 paid submissions, 481 unique researchers paid. Has anybody ever been paid from a bug crowd bounty? Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool, awesome, it's great to see that. That's really cool. Um, yep, top payout, 13.5. This is pretty dense, um, but I just wanted to point out a couple things. The yellow line here is the average amount per bounty, and the average priority is the blue. And so it's good if blue is low and yellow is high. So that's actually a pretty awesome bounty right there. Um, and you can see the average amount ranges from, you know, around 200 um, up to 800 across some of these different bounties. Um, is that what everybody expected? I mean, is there any sort of getting a couple nods? Cool. The goal here is kind of to show you what's getting paid out. Um, and, and sort of where that fits. So average payout per valid issue. Um, I wanted to point out on the bug crop program, which is something we can share here, the average payout is 200, and we paid out 111 submissions. And you can see how that looks relative to other programs on the platform. Um, so we've paid out a relatively high number of submissions. Others haven't paid out as many. Um, our average amount is, you know, pretty low compared to others. So it should give you a sense of what's actually getting paid out. Cool. Um, these are actually time boxed bounties. Same thing here, average amount versus number of submissions. And so you can see, um, you know, these are actually two week programs. So they, our flex programs are two weeks uh, at a time. And um, anyway, you get the idea. Anywhere from 100 to 500 on those. Turns out that the average payout per submission is around 200 bucks across all different programs. It's okay. Um, across all researchers, so uh, let me say this again. Every researcher has been paid on average $1,200 through our programs. And overall, the market is growing. So there's, you know, give or take around 5 million out there. Uh, this is just off the back of the napkin based on statistics for Facebook, Google, um, that sort of thing. And it basically means there's 45 to 60 full-time researchers at $100,000 a pop. The reason to share this data is transparency to the researcher community and really to bring people to a point where they can understand what's actually getting paid out. So, ready to start a bug bounty program? Um, the, what I'd like to say here is that we've learned a lot starting bug bounty programs. We've done over 150 of them. Um, there's a lot of lessons that have come out of those. Um, you know, we've had people start their own programs and come to Bug Crowd. We've had programs start on the Bug Crowd platform. Um, there's really great lessons that come out of each of these. So first things first. Have you run Burp Suite on your application before you actually bring it to a bug bounty? Uh, we have people who come to the platform and want to start a bug bounty program, but literally every uh, input on their application is vulnerable to SQL injection. Not a good reason to uh, start a bug bounty program, not a good way to start a bug bounty program. Um, it doesn't necessarily apply to this audience, but it's something worth stating. You know, like a bug bounty isn't a replacement for your application security fundamentals, period. Um, you're going to want to make friends with your legal department. What happens when you're approached by a friendly researcher who wants to disclose bugs to you, but you don't have a program yet? Should you talk to them? Is that extortion? I mean, where is that line? Um, we had a program where, or actually we had a customer that came to us and said, hey, we've got a guy. He'd like to disclose some issues. Um, we don't have a program yet but we're interested in entertaining it. And what we ended up doing was starting a private program so that he could submit to the company and they could pay him privately. They didn't actually run a public bug bounty program at that point. Um, he wanted 2,500 euros per issue. Um, it was a financial site. There was XSS in the financial site. They agreed to pay him $750. Um, and so they both kind of walked away happy from that. There was a little bit of negotiation happened there. Um, long story short on that one, they ended up starting a private program, accepted some issues from that, and, and the researcher got paid and everybody walked away. It's good. 
Um, what happens if a researcher discloses a bug before, it, before it's fixed? How do you deal with that? You know, what leverage do you have in that case? Something to think about, something to think uh, and talk to your legal team about. Have you considered the reputational risk of prosecuting researchers? Um, how many people have seen the Chris Roberts case? I think there's quite a few folks. For those who aren't familiar, uh, Chris Roberts was disclosing issues in United um, publicly um, on Twitter and in, in other channels, apparently. Um, and United Airlines basically went after him. Um, and you know he's in significant legal trouble. They've since started a bug bounty program. Um, there's a gray line there. Um, it's sort of a gray area. Um, can he submit to the bug bounty program now? Is he allowed to do that? I don't know. Um, what happens if former employees show up and participate? We actually had an issue uh, not long ago where a former employee came, was invited to a program, participated, it, uh, participated in it, and we found out later, well, the, the customer themselves were actually pretty upset about it. Uh, because the employee had been fired and had some insider information. And, you know, what do you do in that case? Should you accept issues from them? Do you have a policy around it? Something to think about. Um, this is interesting. Unauthorized access or attempts to use, alter, destroy, damage data programs, etc. This is on one of their systems, and they recently started a bounty. What takes precedence? Should you listen to this, or should you listen to the terms of the bounty? Something to think about. Um, ideally, everything would be aligned, and, and if you had a bounty, you wouldn't see stuff like this. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you should provide a support channel for questions um, if you're going to run a bug bounty. Is the development team on board? You're going to have to work with them. Um, you need to be able to set expectations with researchers and, you know, work with them in order to communicate and get the things fixed. Um, you know, average fix time runs somewhere between 30 and 120 days. Is your dev team ready for that? Can you communicate to them fast enough, have them fix it, and get it back out? Have you thought about budgeting? Um, If you fund too low, if you start a bounty with, with payouts that are too low, you're going to get more out-of-scope issues. Um, we see this pretty consistently. Um, there was a mobile, ban a mobile bounty that ran on the platform with a $2,500 prize pool. How many submissions do you think they got? Zero. <laughs> well, they, they got submissions, but they were all out-of-scope. Nothing in the mobile, no mobile bounty. And in fact, there was an XXE on a server. Should they pay for that? How many people would pay for that? It's out of scope. It's a high value bug. One? Just one? It's applicable, right? I don't know. It depends, right? How do you handle out of scope issues? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Prezi actually um, did this a while ago. They said, you know, if we're going to make a change, we'll go ahead and pay it. Um, and we see that a lot where um, companies have to make that decision once they receive an out-of-scope issue that is legitimately a problem. Um, they want to fix it. Um, They did. They did. Speaking of the United Bug Bounty, bugs on customer-facing websites such as, such as, what does such as mean here? <clears throat> Should that be, they've got a domain that's UAL.com. Should that be in scope? It's not, I mean, it's customer, isn't, isn't everything on the internet customer-facing, really? Like, uh, so what is in scope? Um, do you have explicit scope on your web applications? What if you need credentials? 
Um, what versions? This gets really tough when you get to hardware, when you've got different firmware versions. Uh, there's a bounty run on the platform where they built a custom firmware version and put it on the hardware and shipped it to researchers. And the researchers worked on it, and it turns out that custom firmware version was slightly out of date. Slightly out of date. There was an RCE that was reported. It was fixed in the latest version. It wasn't fixed in the version they were testing. And wasn't fixed with the customers, with the actual deployed application. Should they pay for it? How many people would pay for it? Yeah. There's some gray areas there. Um, I think they did end up paying for it. Uh, they, didn't, they weren't really sure they wanted to, but it, they did eventually. Um, and actually, with the, the bug, it was kind of interesting. It was RCE um, via UPnP, which is kind of a big deal. Like, um, so just going back to this, you know, good, clear uh, scope here. This, this is actually, it's a good start. I mean, I'd love to see star.united.com and other domains, but the more explicit you can get, the better. Um, bugs on the United app. What's the United app? Where is that? I assume it's a mobile app. I don't know. So, so this, this particular program is open and public. There's two really categories you can put them in. Time boxed. Um, usually time boxed are fixed budget. So you really have like $10,000 that just pff, until it runs out, then it closes down. Um, or there's the ongoing programs. The ongoings are harder. We don't have a lot of data that says, I mean, it's hard to know up front. How much are you going to spend? We often en end up advising companies to start low and then work it up over time. So start it. 50 to 500, move up from there. What level of access are you going to provide to researchers? Um, a lot of folks are coming to the platform wanting to distribute credentials to researchers. I saw a shaking head. <laughs> Is that a bad idea? Yes. Why? Yeah, but maybe that stuff's just out of scope. Maybe it doesn't need to be tested. Oh. Oh. I don't know. Yeah. What happens when you give researchers credentials and their administrator credentials, and they're all administrator credentials? <laughs> Pandemonium. Pandemonium. Uh, and, and often not intentionally, right? The researchers generally are well-intentioned, and what you have is somebody running a, a, a scanner locking out all the other accounts. <laughs> oh, what a pain. Um, if you can't control the applications, put them on a reset. Put them on a 24-hour reset. Um, and that'll basically let you, you know, get to a point where every 24 hours you've got a clean environment. You have to think about how you're going to distribute those credentials, too. Something to think about. We are seeing more people do this, which I think is cool. I actually think this is a good thing. Um, largely because not every app has self-sign-up. Good question. 50-50. Um, so um, the data we have says, um, and we generally try to talk to people and say, you can do this in production, or you can do it in staging. Staging generally requires more work if front, but you know, like there's the risk reducing mechanism there of having a separate environment. Um, some folks run through a proxy before they actually hit production or staging. Like that's another way to do it. Um, but yeah, 50-50. Um, some things to think about. How are you planning to reward swag, money, points, whatever, Hall of Fame? Um, if you're going to think about swag, we'll talk about it in a sec, but think about the fact that you have to ship these around the world. Um, oftentimes, people pay more in postage than they do in the actual swag. Um, do you have a fixed budget? How much, I mean, how much do you have, really? You have to think about um, how much time it's going to take you to respond to issues, especially if you run an open public program. Sort of rule of thumb, 
stick your finger in the air, 50% of the money you pay out goes to payouts, or, or sorry, as much money as you pay out, you have to pay that much in full-time employees supporting it, responding to issues. Rule of thumb. Um, how quickly can you respond? Goes back to that. How long was it? Four weeks? Yeah. Four weeks for United? It's pretty slow. I mean, does anybody think that's okay? Good? I don't Why? <laughs> Why? You get a big bump right here. You get a big bump right here. Like when you actually release the bounty. I'll get into that in a second. But like you get overwhelmed with issues pretty easily. Um, and I'm sure United is buried right now. Buried. Um, have, have you been clear about disclosure on your brief? Like do you actually allow disclosure? Something to think about. Um, have you considered starting it privately? Um, wow, sorry, the color on this slide. Uh, something to think about private. Like, I don't know that most folks know this is an option these days. Um, it's definitely something to think about. You can open to a small number of researchers. Um, make it fixed budget, fixed time if you want. Um, you have, because you're not open to the internet, you can actually have less range in your skills and, and so therefore higher minimums. Like, basically, the people you're getting are qualified. Um, and it's good for getting started and sort of opening it over time. Just something to think about. Um, here's a public program. Uh, they started the bounty here. Um, got about 80 issues in the first day. Drops off over time, or in the first couple days. What happened here? Anybody know? New release, push a code, article. Published on bug track. Sorry, what was it? They give the money. They give the money. There you go. There it is. They started with no reward. And then they paid rewards, and all of a sudden they bumped. Right? And I think here's a news article, um, some other things. I think they doubled their rewards right there, just for a short amount of time. I think. But there's one guy with about an hour a day responding to this. Poor bastard. Uh, we've actually um, done a lot of work with them. And eventually, they just got to the point where they sort of threw their hands in the air and said, you know what, we can't keep up. Let's just pay the issues that we validated thus far, and let's start clean. Um, it's pretty easy to get overwhelmed with a public program. Um, compare that to a private program. Um, and I did want to point out the priority here is, is sort of four is, is a low priority issue. A one is a high priority issue. Um, there's just such a wide range of issues here um, with, a, with a private program. And sorry for the difference in the graphs. Submissions coming in, validated submissions, 2.9 being a pretty awesome priority level. Um, so you can see the, the scale of the issues coming in is a lot less. It's easier to deal with. Um, about 50% of our programs are private. Um, some of the larger public programs have five designated staff responding to submissions. Um, Facebook stat, 1,700 submissions in a year. Um, uh, more than nine submissions a day. No holidays. Never, never leaving the office. Um, and you have to think, it's not just like validating the issue and, and figuring out is this a a, a thing. It's actually like working with the researcher and understanding what he's and communicating back and forth. And researchers will argue for it. Um, and, and oftentimes it takes a while to see eye to eye. So it's not just literally responding to a researcher, it's having a dialogue with a researcher. Um, so something to think about there. Um, some of our programs, um, one person responding to 2,400 issues in a year, uh, another one 1,800 issues with half a person. Um, if you aren't prepared, researchers get frustrated. Four weeks to respond to something, eh, OK, I'll go somewhere else. I have better things to do. Uh, it's a good time to mention, uh, I wouldn't advise using email for this. Um, even, in, and I think United started with email. It's hard to say, you know, like maybe that goes back to a tracker. Um, but 
you don't have to use a platform. Use a use a do Zendesk, something, something to track these things. You'll just quickly get overwhelmed if you launch publicly. Um, so what's a valid submission? <clears throat> this happens. Um, there's an issue where a customer gets, a, like this has happened, where a customer gets an issue, um, the researcher is able to, to get RCE in live customer sites, but the customer is saying they didn't follow our extra security steps in our installation document. Should you reward it? No. Why? But there's customers getting exploited with this. Not their problem? Where's that line? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, priority matrix, just to give you a sense of sort of what's in each priority. XXE, SQL injection. You should have this. You should think about this before you start a program. You should absolutely know how you're going to break down issues. And if possible, communicate that up front. The more communication you can put up front, the better. Um, you always want to be able to push back um, to something in the brief. You want to be able to say, we said this isn't a valid issue in the brief. So as much as possible, put the information into the brief. Um, across all programs, invalid and duplicates. 66%, give or take. 68, 69%. Um, this is pretty standard. 20% valid issues. Some higher, some lower. Do you pay out in your experience with all the bug bounty programs? Do you pay out duplicates? No. No. But it's kind of hard to go to research and say, hey, you just found this. Yeah, 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 but we totally knew about it. There was another guy that came first and told us that, so we're not going to pay you. The best thing you can do is respond quickly. If you pay out duplicates, think about it. If you pay out duplicates, what happens? He tells his buddy, and he tells his buddy, and I would tell my buddy, and like, we'd all make some money. <laughs> What's that? Dutch, uh, Dutch Telecom is paying uh, pays, uh, $50 per duplicate, so we can cheat the program. Yeah, of course, of course. I think, you know, like you'd have to manage that, you know, now you've got to put a fraud system in place. How are you going to do that? Good luck. Ab like that you could answer that to everybody. Absolutely. Like, if, you, if you decide to be unhonest. But yeah. Can, can they prove that they use them? Can they somehow prove that? So did they just tell so? That some yeah. programs have proof. Pretty have uh, proof, a big proof. That yeah. That of the they put a gist. Like that, that Who was paid yeah. when? Um, so they can give you a timestamp time stamp proof of okay. yeah. duplicate. Yeah. Yeah, duplicates are tough. Um, the, the goal should be to minimize duplicates as much as possible. We find on the private programs, it gets down to 30, eh, less than that, 20%, somewhere around there. We do our best to manage duplicates. This is a function of too many researchers on a, a, and not enough quick fixes on programs too, right? Like, yeah, exactly. And a lot of programs, like some things don't ever get fixed. They just don't. What do you do about those out of scopes? Um, here's a story. A researcher found an issue with a hardware, again, a hardware device, um, where the, the build tools were on GitHub and pulled those GitHub tools into his own repository, basically cloned the repository. Submitted, submitted an issue, um, let them know that he had access to that GitHub repository. They removed the GitHub repository, but he still had a clone of it. They found out about it. <laughs> and they said, we thought we removed this. Why is it still here? 
not happy. Not a happy interaction there. Um, but is this in scope? Is GitHub in scope? I got a nodding, I got a shaking of heads over there. Why not? There, there were, the GitHub repository literally had credentials for dev and QA systems in it. Well, is it really GitHub's issue? So basically, they put their build tools up. One, one developer put the build tools up on GitHub, published them with passwords in them. Nobody found it until the bounty. During the bounty, the researcher found passwords, used those passwords to log into the dev environment, the QA environment. And it was a mobile bounty again, where this stuff is, again, technically out of scope. So you're almost two, two things removed from out of scope. Should you pay for it? Now, the dev environment basically would have allowed him to craft new firmware and then distribute that to all the customers. So that feels pretty in scope. I don't know. Something to think about. There's other, other examples of this. Um, the, the sort of rule of thumb I always come back to is if you're going to change it, if you're going to make a change, pay for it. Uh, and that's a pretty good like gut feel in terms of whether or not it's important to you. Um, there's other examples of this. A confluence page where they'd stored their credentials, financial information, everything in it in a third party wiki hosted on confluence, hosted by Atlassian. Researcher got access to it. Um, well, it was basically self-sign up. So you could go in and sign up for an account. It gets you access to financial information. It gets you access to company information, passwords. Out of scope? Depends. If you're going to change it, pay for it. Um, another example, France of Detectify. Um, this is often in scope, largely because like, it, it ends up affecting the domain. But basically what happens is you start a new service. You start using Heroku, right? You point a subdomain, app.yourcompany.com, to Heroku. Um, whatever. App goes away. Stop using it. You forget to remove the subdomain. Researcher comes in. Anybody comes in registers that with Heroku. Now they've got a subdomain on your domain. Out of scope? I don't know. Lots of people paid for that one. That was a pretty big issue. Um, the details are there, actually, if you get a chance to check it out. Um, this is just this is a good sort of lesson um, that we've learned. Attack scenarios. If you get an issue and you can't reproduce it and you can't seem to figure out whether it's an, a problem or not, go back to the attack scenario. How would you use this? Push the researcher to come up with the attack scenario, all the prerequisites they'd need, everything to actually reproduce the issue. And what happens if it's just... Cool. Invalid issue. No. Um, yeah, if it's, if it's not an issue that you can reproduce, then definitely not. What, one example, of, or one way to deal with that too, is it, 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 it's possible that it reproduces in the researcher's environment, but not in your environment. How do you deal with that? Shared environment, right? Give them a place to reproduce it. Handling upstream issues. Um, this is one that came in multiple times um, early in 2014, I believe. And over the course of six months, we got a bunch of issues. Basically, it's a file existence disclosure bug. So think like you can go to app.com um, slash whatever.json um, and determine if the file exists, or, or basically like figure out if, if local files exist even, Etsy password, things like that. Um, who should upstream those issues? 
Is that a researcher? Customer? I don't know. But be explicit about it. Talk to the researcher about it. Who reported to Ruby? Ah, in this case, the researcher actually reported it. He upstreamed it. But reported it to everybody running Ruby on the platform before he upstreamed it. Which is okay. I mean, ultimately, everybody's running a bounty. What about swag, re swag rewards? This is literally somewhere we had to ship a t-shirt beside the liquor shop. Six what is the, what is the swag reward? Uh, t-shirt. T-shirt. Are you equipped to handle this? <laughs> uh, I don't know. A lot. <laughs> a lot. Um, back to United. United will provide a payout for each qualifying bug once the issue has been remediated. What about those issues that never get remediated? I mean, they exist, right? Um, 90 days, probably optimistic. Um, we think, in general, we, we ask, um, we give people a, a window um, and we say, if you haven't done anything with the bug in 60 days, consider it abandoned. Um, if it's already validated, if there's a dollar amount assigned to it, just go ahead and close it out. Um, 60 days is a pretty good rule of thumb for activity on a bug. 90 days is a little much. Is there like an independent party in case of disputes that can like, help, negotiate, whatever, decide? Yep. So, so we often end up acting as that party. Um, So depends on the bug. Um, the way it sort of works for us, um, submission comes in, um, gets looked at, gets a priority and a validation, like is it valid, is it reproducible, is it an issue, um, then gets prioritized for the customer and look, they look at it. And if they don't respond within 60 days, it goes back to that status at the beginning, the priority of the validation. So if it's reproducible and it's not out of scope or a duplicate, it gets bad. Anyway, the quicker the feedback loop, the better. Um, so you know, four weeks for a response, you're probably not going to spend a lot of time testing. Um, bumping rewards is always a good idea. Look at that big second bump. That's when they actually released cash rewards. I have to speed up just a little bit. Um, you can use focus areas, so um, points where um, if new code was released, if you can put that in front of researchers, that's a good way to sort of get more activity. Important thing to remember, it's all about the relationships with the researchers. Um, you want to be able to find the best researchers and have them come back to you. We find that the best researchers um, are really valuable. Um, and you should, in general, cater to them as much as possible. Um, you know, perfect example of this, um, researcher got access to a My, uh, actually, uh, I think a MySQL database through a SQL injection on an OAuth parameter. So had access to the database, was able to pull out the hashes, crack those hashes, pull out the database password, root, root of all things, used to log into the, the database contacted support, right? That's, it's important to maintain good ties with those folks. Um, and we do a lot of that. Um, and, and, you know, we, the customer rolled their password shortly thereafter. <laughs> um, since we're close, any questions? Um, so, really good question. Um, I'll talk about how BugCrowd does it, and then I'll talk about how you can do it regardless. Um, we, with us, we look at folks who have submitted before, who are good, who have shown value, have, have a lot of accepted submissions, um, and then give them opportunities to participate. Um, 
what we're starting to see is people running public programs and private programs. So the public program without an incentive, just responsible disclosure, and the private program with rewards, where they're actually incentivizing disclosure, which is working pretty well for them. Another question? So uh, Google recently started a program that they pay researchers beforehand to do research on an application. Yeah. What do you think about this? So, so the question was, Google recently started a program to pay researchers before they do research. Um, it sounds like a contract to me. Um, depends on the terms of the contract. I mean, this is how we do most of security today, right? But they're paying per bug? Uh, they are giving you some money, and then for every bug you find, you get paid additionally for this bug. And even if you find nothing, you can keep the money. So it's like a retainer. Yeah. Sort of like a retainer. Yeah. It, I mean, seems good. Do you like it? Have you done it? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. Need to call Google. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah? So in the last example, does it mean that the step too far when a researcher finds the password to use it? Stop when I find the SSL private key. Where's that line? Yeah. Yeah, where's that line? Um, it gets into the CFAA in the US. So what is authorized access? What is unauthorized access? Um, wasn't it a step too far to set your password to root root? You know, I mean, it's something to think about. Um, I, I think rule of thumb is, yeah, if you're using credentials to log into a site, it's time to report it. Um, because we get so many duplicates, um, I feel relatively confident in saying, if you find it, somebody else can find it. Um, so you risk losing a reward. Uh, good question. Debatable. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, you, have, you have all these bugs which were submitted to you. And uh, I was thinking maybe like the most interesting bugs to, to make them public somehow, like, of course, anonymizing the, the information. Yep. Because companies don't want to have them public. But yep. it would be very good for researchers. To Agree. Work Agree. We're working on it. Okay. We're working on it. Yep. Not quite there yet. Yep. Good. OK. Thanks, guys. And if you have any feedback, this is my email.